you hear me okay? All right? So I, uh, hi friend, good to see you. It's fun to work with all of you. My, my day job is inside sales. I'm also the co-chair for the YSA mission for all the 30 um, YSA and Young Married Stakes in Utah County. So Bob Walls and I report to Elder Runya, the Corma 70. So you'll probably start hearing about the social media mission. If you haven't yet, then get ready because we're, we're coming at you. But what we decided to do is try the things we've learned in business and see if they might work in missionary work. And that's the first principle I want to talk about is innovation. Innovation is taking what works somewhere else and applying it in your world. One of the biggest innovations in manufacturing was the assembly line where you had specialists who put together the parts of a Model T Ford. We wondered if that would work in sales. So we decided to try it and we found that people could do the marketing and others could research the leads, others would set the appointments, others would close the appointments and others would service the accounts. And sales went up 70%. We thought, holy moly. And then we noticed that the other next innovation for on the assembly line was a conveyor belt. And all it really did was make things go faster. So we decided to test that concept as well, and I'll be telling you that story. So I, I was given a list of some great questions here, and I'll try and jump in. The first one is, where did you get that crazy idea to do inside sales? Well, I, I uh, got off my mission from, to South Carolina, and I only had one skill, knocking doors. So my buddy shows up in a silver Porsche and says, you should go into business selling computers with me. I said, well, that'd be great. Little did I know he had to park the Porsche in the back alleyway so it wouldn't get repossessed because he couldn't make the payments. So we had to scramble and really learn how to sell. That was back when laptop computers were about this big and looked like the size of a big lunchbox. And most of you don't even know what a lunchbox is, probably. But um, we, we learned how to really uh, make some impact with some rules, some business rules. And those are the things when I speak, especially to young people starting off in this entrepreneurial world that, that they want to hear about the most. So I'm going to try and throw out a lot of rules. Would that be okay? And I'll try and give you a name so you can remember them. And the first one is what I call the business card rule. And uh, I went to work with my friend and laptops were so exciting back then. I spent three weeks just designing my business cards and I never sold a dang thing but I had a really cool business card. So that's the first rule is don't worry about your business cards. Just go sell something. Go get your product into production and then iterate. Don't take forever making it perfect because nothing's perfect. By the time you get it perfect, the market's already changed on you. So when I met Dave Elkington 13 years ago, I told him the business card rule. I said, Dave, Here's the deal. I will not work with you unless you'll commit. We won't even have business cards until we've done $2 million in sales. He said, I'm in. And uh, that was actually what we did. The next thing, the next rule that I learned was the rule of leverage. And um, I remember, in fact, I'll come back to that one in a little bit. Let me, let me go to the next one. So uh, at Franklin Covey, I was asked to start an inside sales department there. And they had never, this was in the early 90s, and they had $300,000 salespeople who would go face to face, and nobody believed that we could actually sell over the phone or through the internet. And um, we, st we, we started up the, the department in about 2000, excuse me, 1994, 93, 94, and we were cold calling, and um, we weren't doing very well. One day I was walking down the aisleway between the buildings, and the receptionist was sitting there, and she had a big stack of postcards. And the postcards had on them, are you interested in a time management seminar? Check. And that was what we were selling. And we had, and I, and I looked and I said, where did you get these? And she said, well, they're going all the way to the replacement of the day planner refills every year when people order. I said, how many of those get sold? She said, three million. I said, give me those. <laughs> and I grabbed the stack, and I went running back, and I gave it to our best salesperson, and he called up, there was 125 in the stack and we closed 25 of them. And here's what I learned. Write this one down. It's all about the leads. 
It's all about people who are interested in what you do. Now, uh, the Emoth by Michael Gerber, he said, of all the business rules you can learn, learn that one. It's all about the leads. If you can find a river of traffic of people who need you, you'll be successful. Now, what do I mean by a river of traffic? Well, that takes me to my next rule. And um, I'll try and show you how I applied it. This is the, most, the single most powerful rule that I use in marketing. And um, I've been ranked number two in the United States for social selling. And my company was ranked number one for social influence. We didn't know we were being measured, which is a good thing. But salespeople have to do something different with social media that everybody else does not. We have to sell something. If we don't close a sale, we don't get paid. Most social media is about likes and shares and friends and buzz and, you know, and, and nothing happens. Have you, ever, have you ever watched what happens? In fact, in the YSA mission, we get really concerned because conference comes out and there's this in interesting phenomenon called Mormon memes. Millions of really cool pictures about President Uchtdorf flying another jet and Elder Holland speaking again, right? And, uh, but no baptisms happen. None. So what we learned is you have to cause results. You have to get a result. And so we were ranked really high because we do something in social media that other people don't do. It's called call to action. CTA, call to action. That's the most powerful thing you can do if you want results. And this number one rule that I have is called divert a river, don't dig a well. Let me give you an example. Divert a river, don't dig a well. A river is an existing flow of need or of traffic or of emotion that's already there. Go find value. Go find need and fill it. Don't create it if you want leverage. The word InsideSales.com, I went to work with Dave Elkington 13 years ago. Our first lunch was at Bajio's. We actually crafted our business plan on a napkin. We really did. And in fact, we had shrimp tacos. Oh, I'd take them with a needle if I could. <laughs> By the way, um, write down your ideas, hold on to them. But I told Dave, I said, the best name we could possibly have would be the name of the category. We were trying to figure out what to call our company. And this is the best place to start, you guys. So I went out to the Google Keyword Planner tool which most people don't even know that exists, it's free. Or Google Trends is also free. And I typed in the phrase, inside sales. And we found 40,000 companies trying to hire people in inside sales. But you know those little Google ads along the side? There weren't any. That's a good place to be. In other words, inside sales was a keyword. And we had 40,000 searches a month and not a single competitor. That's a river. And the Google trend graph went just like this. Woo. Note to self, don't do one that does this, do one that does this. And we bought the name Inside Sales after six months of negotiation from a guy who started out, he wanted $100,000. And he did not know that I had a business partner who was a master at Chinese water torture. And we just worked him over for six months. And right before Christmas, we got a phone call. He says, okay, uncle. If you give me $3,000 today so I can buy my Christmas for my kids, I'll give you the dang URL. So we bought InsideSales.com. We turned up the name. And on the eighth day of January, we had eight leads. We didn't even done any marketing yet. But automatically, we started appearing at the front page of Google because we had the keyword with all the traffic. We diverted a tire river. Now we get 35,000 leads a month and we're the top of the search engines in our keywords. Does that make sense? So don't come up with some funky name that has no value. If you can, grab a name that says what you do, especially if what you do is in Google. Google is the biggest river on the planet. Did you know that in 2012, Google moved ahead of all magazines and all newspapers combined for advertising revenue? The world has been completely disrupted by Google. And now Facebook is massive. Facebook and Amazon 
all these incredible ecosystems. So you've got to find an ecosystem where you can tap into a river of value or of need and tap it, okay? If there's a pain out there, fill it. And that's the best place to start a business. So we started just taking off. And nobody had ever built technology in a, a SaaS or a cloud-based environment that could help people sell more over the phone and through the internet. So I told Dave, I said, the best thing we could do is to take the name of the category and make it into an industry. When inside sales came out, everybody thought it was telemarketing. And it's not. Telemarketing is that call you get at dinner time when you have to say no seven times before they'll hang up, and now they even call you on your cell phone. You know what I'm talking about? Who's, who's had that? Come on. You know what I'm talking about? We all hate it. Tele is a four letter word, right? So the first thing I did is I wrote an article on my blog that said inside sales is not telemarketing, and it's not customer service where you close something, it's professional sales done remotely. Or in other words, inside sales is remote sales. So I wrote the definitional article, and little did I know, there was about three million inside sales reps in the United States who were sick and tired of being called telemarketers. So guess whose blog they followed? And my blog just started taking off. I'm like, holy crap, what do I do? And my friend just said, keep writing, keep writing. So I would ask them what to write about. That's the next rule. In fact, I do a lot of help with causes, and we help the Boy Scouts of America. And um, they had me come in to try and help them with Schofield Reservoir because nobody was going there for the scout camp. And I was in this big room, and all these old guys, you know, old fat guys like me, with lots of knots over their pocket, and they got that red jacket with all the patches they've ever been to since they were a kid. Um, and we're sitting there, and they're all excited. They were telling me their business plan for Schofield. They're saying, well, boy, we've got more merit badge classes this year. And we've got uh, this really cool Western Fort. And we got this, I said, wait a minute, Western Fort? I said, really? You think these kids still play cowboys and Indians? I said, they're going to be ticked because they don't have their cell phone with them and you've got a Western Fort. I'm going to ask you guys a really hard question. Have you asked the kids what they want you to do? And all of a sudden there was just silence in the room. And I'm like, they haven't asked, have they? They think they know what their audience wants, but they have no idea. So we stopped the process right there, and we went out and we surveyed a bunch of scouts who'd been to Schofield Reservoir, and we asked them, what did you love the most about Schofield? Guess what? The Western Fort wasn't even on the list. They didn't even know what it was. <laughs> you know what the top of the list was? Crawdads crayfish. They would steal a hot dog from the lunchroom and put it on a string. After the merit badge classes were over, they'd go out there and dip it in the water, and three crawdads, they'd put it in a pot, get about 50 of them, and then they'd go cook them. They were like little baby lobsters. That was all they remembered about Schofield. So guess what we put on the cover of the next brochure? Crawdads. Sales went up. So, write the crawdad rule. What does it mean? It means find what your audience cares about. And from now on, whenever you see a lobster, or you go to Red Lobster, you're gonna think, little baby crawdads. And you're gonna remember, that, that will change your whole world if you remember that rule, you guys. So by the way, I'm a little bit right brain, and I'm recovering from a really bad car accident, where I had a double con concussion, and so I'm like all over the map. So I'll try and get back to where I thought I was when I left, but well, you know, if, if, I, if I forget a, a story or halfway through, just sort of remind me, okay? I'll just do my best here but I am making some pretty good recovery. So I was talking about, what, what was I talking about right before the crawdads? Do you remember? Diverting a river. Okay, so you got the basic concept of our name. That was the river, was the traffic. Now, I told you about the tool, there are two of them. Google Keyword Planner Tool. That thing is amazing. You have to have a free AdWords account, it actually costs you five bucks. But it's a tool that lets you search on the keywords people type in and how much traffic they have on each keyword per month. Why is that important? Well, I write for Forbes magazine, and I started using the Google Keyword Planner tool to write my articles, and it freaked out the editors. They called me up, said, Ken, um, 
we think you're doing something a little bit underhanded here. I said, everybody else writes an article in six days, nobody reads it anymore. Your article, they write it, and three years later, you're getting more every day than the previous day. You've had 350,000 views on this article. It's getting better every day. How'd you do that? I said, well, I told you about it three years ago. It's called the Google Keyword Planner Tool. I wrote an article about Twitter. It's now the number one article in the world about Twitter. And I went out to the Google Keyword Planner Tool, and I said, okay, what would people want to know if they were trying to learn about Twitter? I used to think Twitter was like not even useful in the business world. I still sometimes wonder about it, but it's sort of fun because I, one day I wrote an article on Forbes and sent out to my you know, 30 something thousand followers on Twitter and my article became number one because everyone out would comment. I said, oh, I like Twitter. <laughs> well, I went to the Google Keyword Planner tool and it says, okay, Twitter tips, that's probably something. I typed in Twitter tips, there was like 30,000 searches. Holy crap, there's a river. Twitter tools, Twitter best practices, Twitter best practices for business. And you know what I did? I put them all together. Here's my title. 31 Twitter tips, colon, Twitter tools and Twitter best practices for business. And I had all eight of the keywords in the same headline. And so how many rivers was I diverting? You see how it works? So if you're gonna do anything on social media, Use the power of Google to have people read it. Does that make sense? So that's a concept of how you divert a river. So you ready for rule number two? <coughs> Swim with the sharks. Now there's a book called Swim with the Sharks. That's not what I mean. A shark is a really big brand. Steve Jobs was a shark, and so is Apple. It could be a person. It could be a company. But if you'll swim with the sharks and align yourself with big brands, their brand equity will rub off on you. I learned this from Lindsay Sterling. I interviewed her for Forbes before she was really cool. And the, the church asked me to help get their Facebook series up and running. So we had just done David Archuleta and we brought in Lindsay Sterling and then Elder Bednar and then Elder Holland. And I got to interview her and Devin Graham and Stuart Edge and the Harmon brothers. And they all started telling me about two secret rules they've got in marketing for YouTube. Did you know that Lindsay Sterling, who, Lindsay Sterling, everybody? She's the highest paid woman in all of YouTube. You know those little 15 second ads that you click, skip? Do you know that advertisers pay big bucks for those ads to go on videos that are relevant to the kind of people that they want to sell to or the kind of products they want to sell? And did you know that Lindsay gets 55% commission? She makes $45,000 a month just off those ads. Holy crap. <laughs> so those viral videos, they start paying big bucks. All right? Well, when I interviewed her, and you can go look on my Forbes article, I did a three-part series on the YouTubers, and she said, Ken, there's two main rules. Two main rules. You ready for them? By the way, I bail out $20,000 a day when I can go consult with companies, and um, I give it for free to the YSAs because they rock. And you're, I mean, we started this class with a prayer, you guys. Where two or three are gathered, the Spirit will be with us, and we got how many here, 170? You're covenant servants of the Lord, and these tools can be really powerful in your world. So I hope that they help. I forgot where I was. Where was I? Yeah, see, I leave you on a cliffhanger, and you, you remember where I was. Right? <laughs> Two main rules, she said, Ken, there's collabs and covers. I said, what? She said, yeah, let me explain. A cover is when you play or sing another famous song that's already famous, and you just do it again. A collab is where you do it with a famous person, like Pentatonix or... Um, Peter Hollins, or all these people that she's... So she does both. Now, Swim with the Sharks is that very rule. I just call it something different. It's a collaboration. So what I do is I align my social media with other big influencers. I call them gladiators. Al Fox, a tattooed Mormon. Remember her? So the church comes to me and they says, what are we going to do to get Elder Holland's Facebook event to really show up? And I said, well... Give me a half dozen YSAs and we'll work Snapchat. They said, Snapchat, not Snapchat. I said, no, we're going to do Snapchat. And then we're going to do Instagram. What's Instagram? We, we were thinking Facebook. Well, we'll have some of that too. 
So we're sitting there in the audience, and um, we got Al and about 19 other, you know, famous Twitter account people who are LDS. And then we said, and then go get your top five LDS Twitter accounts and start sending stuff out. So we were there right in the middle, and you know what? We ranked number four globally in an hour with only a half dozen YSAs helping us out. What could we do with 55,000 of you guys and gals? Wouldn't that be cool? Elder Holland's event was number four in the world. Isn't that awesome? Because we collaborated. What happens with social media is if we look at it like a toy, we just go in all directions. But if we look at it like a tool and we align in the same direction, amazing things can start happening. So a cover is where you take advantage of a, a big brand name that's already out there, like um, Les Mis, she played this song for that, or Phantom of the Opera. And you know what put her on the map? She told me that it was one video that she did, and she was coached by Devin Supertramp. They used to date, by the way, did you not? <laughs> he just got married, so I better not say that. Um, I think he did. Anyway, he said, there is a Zelda game coming out, and it has a soundtrack, and nobody has ever done a cover of the Zelda soundtrack before. So go out to Lindsay's site and look up the Zelda video. She dressed up like the little elf and went up in the woods above Provo with a 4K camera filming her, and she filmed the soundtrack of Zelda and did it a week before it launched. 27 million views later, she was a superstar. That's it. And then she did it again with um, Assassin's Creed, right? And then she said, well, I better not focus on video games too much. So then she went over and she did some classical music. And, and then she did, and then guess what she did? She learned the same law that Costco has figured out. She put in one of her own little products. Remember the crystallized video? 50 million views. That was one that's hers. And at a buck a download, she can make some pretty good money. Mm -hmm. So every four or five collabs and covers, she does one of her own. She puts in her own product. That's what Costco does. You figure that out? Costco only sells one or two products in a category. They sell the best they can find that will stack it deep and sell it cheap and bundle like six bottles of ketchup together, right, and get the biggest bottle. And then after they sell enough water bottles of Arrowhead or whatever, well, then they do a, what kind of brand? Kirkland brand. Their brand. But they first rode the brand of the shark. Does that make sense? And then they sell the guts out of it with their own brand. So I get too excited. How close am I here, time-wise? Okay, should we cram in a bunch more rules for you guys? Okay, so the next rule, so I've given you the two big ones for marketing are divert a river, don't dig a well. The second one is swim with the sharks. But here's what I've learned about sharks. There's two kinds of fish that swim with a the shark. There's the remora with a little sucker on its head that attaches itself. It becomes a parasite. And the shark tries to kill it because it does nothing for the shark. But then there's another little fish that swims by the mouth of the shark, it's called a pilot fish. And it eats the, the bugs and the parasites and, the, and it's symbiotic, it gives back to the shark. So whenever you do something with a big brand, make sure what you give them is of, is of great value as well. So that's what I decided to do with my little blog. Nobody knew who I was. But there were about 50 big thought leaders and authors in the inside sales space. But they were all over the map. So I looked at all of them, and, and the best one was Trish Bertuzzi. She ran a LinkedIn group with like 35,000 people in it, in inside sales, and I, I started following her. There's a little formula we teach you in the social media mission called look, listen, like, love. You gotta write that one down. Look, you look at what they're doing, you listen to their conversation, you press that like button, because if you like them, are they gonna like you back? That's just a sign of intelligence, right? They wanna like you back. And then love is actually an acronym. It stands for L-U-V, leave unsolicited validation. Show them some love. Tell them how cool they are. Ask them questions. Leave comments, in other words. And the best kind of comment is called a conversation. How do you get someone to comment back to you? 
ask a question. Brilliant. Oh, you do. So you, you leave a few comments, and then you ask a question, and now a conversation starts happening, and now you know them. So I went up to Trish at one of the trade shows we speak at together. She came up and gave me a big old hug. And I said, Trish, we ought to do something together. Should we do like a webinar or something? Oh, that'd be great. Because I had all these tens of thousands of followers and this big database of sales managers because we sell software. And she had you know, this LinkedIn group. So we collaborated together. We did a one hour webinar, half an hour of mine, half an hour of hers, and went to town. And she called me up a week later. She said, can we do that again? She said, wow, my, my views and leads and everything went through the roof. I said, me too, this was great. We both did better. You see how that's symbiotic? So what a fun thing when you both do better. But the difference was I did it with all 49 of the other leaders in the space. And by about the fifth one, my brand was equal. And by the tenth one, my brand was ahead. By the fiftieth one, my brand was number one in the world. Does that make sense? Divert a river, swim with the sharks. Those two together go really well. The third rule, I used to call stir the pot. You know what I call it now? The Trump rule. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh, he's completely redefined. Whether we like him or don't like him, he has redefined PR forever in the world of politics. Why? Because he stirs the pot. You get 10 times to 100 times the play if you're not afraid to avoid political correctness and just say things that are true or that are strong. In Trump's case, they're not always true, but you know, you just be afraid. Don't be afraid to speak what you th say what you think and, and get, get your, that, that's what's so cool about social media and about this world of internet is your voice can be heard around the world. Have you guys seen the video, United Breaks Guitars? Isn't that cool? Change the stock price of United Airlines. Wow. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's pretty powerful. Um, let's see if we can keep going here. So those are my three rules. Divert a river, don't dig a well. Swim with the sharks. And stir the pot. And those will get you what you need. The next one is, how did you, your idea develop a pivot or transition over time? And what inspired you to launch your business? Well, don't go at it blind. This is a, a, cri a critical point here. Learn on someone else's dime. Write that one down. Learn on someone else's dime. You know, one of the biggest concerns we have with graduates from BYU is they come out and your professors teach you that you're ready to go make $80,000. And you're almost ready, but don't be afraid to start at the bottom and learn from a good mentor. Learn from a good mentor. Come out being humble and ready to learn. And those mentors, well, now what's the difference between a mentor and a coach and a teacher? A teacher stands up here and just does what I'm doing. A coach goes out on the field and does it with you, but a mentor cares about the outcome. They're worth their weight in gold. And I've had several mentors. I recruit mentors. Nothing is better to go someone you respect and say, hey, would you be willing to teach me and mentor me, guide me, because I'm listening, I'm all ears. And your personal stock price will go through the roof if you'll be teachable and open. And always get there a little early and leave a little late, not the reverse. Make sure your value is by what you deliver, the results that you can bring. So we get asked all the time how we funded our startup. We didn't. Wow, that's a little bit controversial. Dave and I decided we would not take money until we no longer needed money. So we started our own little business. I brought in some funding that I had just started. We started a web development business just doing custom programming for people so we could get cash flow. And then we kept shopping for a project that would fund itself and, and be our, our sort of our nest egg. And we got hired by Intel to write a CRM software package to replace Salesforce. And they paid for it and got a discount because we kept the intellectual property. And now we had a development team being funded and the software ready to go. And that's what Dave brought to the table and I brought in my piece which was the dialer technology. And so we did not raise money. We just scrapped our way into, our favorite word is this one, scrappy. Now some people think that means cheap and it sort of does. <laughs> 
But it, what it really means is that kind of, it's, it's the measure of the dog in the fight or the fight in the dog, right? It's grit. It's determination. It's willing to stay up a little bit late and watch. Do you know what Dave did during the first few years while we were running that business? He was a janitor at night so he could make payroll. But we've raised $200 million and we're the only unicorn that hasn't given away full ownership in the company. You know? Because we had already gotten traction. See, here's what happens if you just throw money at the problem, you don't really care about the outcome. But if it's your money, you will. You will be, in fact, my favorite example is Hyundai. They decided to put a 100,000 mile warranty out on their cars. And they weren't even ready yet. <laughs> but what did that force them to do? Get ready really fast. So by doing that, they put a stake in the sand that says, we will be the best. And within about three or four years, they beat Toyota in quality. And then one of their sister companies, Kia, did the same thing. And of course, Toyota got a little bit ticked off and came back at them. But don't be afraid to make a commitment to be something better than you really are and then just work your way into it. You know, so I'm not a fan, frankly, of just fundraising first with just an idea. Go prove you can get some traction, you know. Put some of your own money into it, and then you'll, then you'll care, and then it will happen. We had more growth when we had no money than we had $200 million, you guys. Anyway, so that was, that's, that's my personal vote. What major problems did you face that required resolution before you could prosper? Well, pride. Oh my gosh, ego. Um, those are big challenges, especially if you're a Latter-day Saint and you're a covenant servant of the Lord and all of a sudden you're being faced with being worth a couple hundred million dollars. You know, you can only make a deal with one side or the other. And you better make sure which side you're going to make the deal with. Because you can do it with the law of the jungle, or you can do it with the Lord's way. And the Lord's way is a little different. I remember when I was a um, financial clerk here in Provo with my little two little kids of my five, and I'm opening tithing one day, and... I nudged the bishopric member next to me and I said, wow, that person makes a lot of money. It's really easy when you count tithing because it's like 10% each time, put no more zero there. Whoa, they make a lot of money. <laughs> I, I can't say anything, but they make a lot of money. He said, I said, I wish I could. I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm, I'm a sales guy over at a computer store and I'm starving. He said, it sounds like you haven't learned the law of finance the Lord's way yet, have you? I said, tithing? He said, well, sort of, it's a little bit more than that. I said, then I haven't. He said, I was in a room when Mary and G. Romney made us a promise. And he said, those of you who need a raise, double your fast offering. I thought, really? That's it? And then he said, and then he said something else. He said, and if you need another raise, double them again. He said, if you need your needs, pay your tithing. If you need your wants, pay your offering. And I went home to Crystal that day and I said, I just was told this amazing thing. And should we try it? We were paying like 15 bucks in like fast offerings. Yeah, do it. So we doubled them, and that week I was promoted. I'm like, whoa, three months later, Crystal, should we try it again? We doubled them again. I was made sales manager. Now, I'm sure the Lord was trying to teach me something, but I bear you my witness that he's watching you, and he doesn't want you to sell your soul. I told Dave, I said, Dave, the biggest challenge we're going to have is to keep our souls intact when we're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And you have no idea how hard it is. We were talking about being a unicorn. It's not all it's cracked up to be. One of my dear friends, I won't mention his name because it would be embarrassing, but he was a mission president. Brought seven of his missionaries in the business with him. And they all became worth tens of millions of dollars and only two of them stayed in the gospel. Now a couple came back, but they made serious mistakes. And when you get thrown that kind of power and influence, you better be ready for it. And you better scale your way into it. But if you are interested, there is a Lord's way of doing things. And that was just the beginning. There's another little book called Magnificent Obsession by Lloyd C. Douglas, written in 1929. If you're really interested, there's some clues in that book that will teach you the Lord's way of, of doing business. 
and of uh, gaining blessings. So I'll keep going here. What specifically caused your business to begin to gain traction? Am I about five minutes or so, 10? Pretty close, about five minutes. Okay. So the number one thing that put us on the map was research. We decided, um, in fact, it was funny, we were selling like crazy, and um, we had this name inside sales that was generating all these leads. So here we had this technology that was supposed to be for cold calling. We never cold called because we had so many leads. We would just respond. And the salespeople kept telling us, they said, it seems like when we call people back really fast, we make the sale. We said, wait a minute, speed? They said, yeah. So we get the web leads, and if you call them back really fast, you close the sale, and if you don't, you don't? Yeah. So we said, oh my gosh. So we decided to do a research study with Dr. James Oldroyd from MIT, and we tested how fast should you respond to a lead. That was it. And he called us back three weeks later after we gave him like 10,000 data points. He says, boy, your salespeople were right. If you can call a lead back within five minutes, the odds of making contact with the person you're trying to reach go up 100 times. We said, wait a minute, you mean 100%? He said, no, 100 times. I'm like, oh my gosh. I call my back, call people back really, 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 really fast. You know those, those messages that come to your email? Call back really, really, really fast. And the best they could do manually was 30 minutes. And that missed the whole effect. Five minutes was the best practice. So we built a technology that captured the lead on the website, looked up who, should, who it should go to, see who the sales rep was, call the sales rep first, they hear the ring, 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 and then the answer they hear ringing, and a second line calls the lead and bridges the two together in nine seconds. I remember Dunn and Bradstreet went out to our website, they typed in their information, we called them back in nine seconds, and the guy answered, he said, we still have a recording, he said, I don't know what you just did, but we're going to buy it. <laughs> 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 and hustle, hustle, that's scrappy. So then we did another technology. And by the way, we published that in a research study. 600,000 companies have downloaded it. <coughs> Put us on the map. So our forte began research. Remember I told you earlier the crawdad story? That was research. We asked them what they needed, and then we just aligned with it. Well, we put out a new research study every month now. And all we do is we ask salespeople, what's the, what's the biggest challenge you got? They say, well, it's hard to reach people who are really busy. Oh, well, let's see if we can help. And we go research it. And we come up with a cool idea and give it back to them. That's, that's diverting a river of need. Does that make sense? So that was the single most powerful thing we, we learned was the power of research to answer questions the market really needs. When did you begin to scale and how did you find the growth stage of your business? Well, like I told you, it wasn't when we raised money. It was when we were disciplined and scrappy about executing our business. My favorite book is Good to Great in the business world. And it talks about building this flywheel of momentum. If, if you haven't read it, it says there are three ingredients to become great. And this is what I'd really recommend you look at. You gotta do things that you love. You've got to do things that you can be the best in the world at. And you've got to be able to make money. Because that's what put gas in the gas tank. But you've got to do what you love. Can you tell I love what I do? I have a blast. I get to meet with folks like you and learn cool new things all the time. I went out and took a, a test called Strengths Finder 2.0. Has anybody taken it? If you haven't, write it down. It's only, I think, 10 bucks. And there are 36 strengths or 34 strengths out there. 15.5 million people have taken it. And it gives you your top five. And the basic premise is play to your strengths. Play to your strengths. Play to your talents that you were given. My number one strength is learning. So whenever I'm down and depressed or having the world's weight on my shoulders, I go learn something new. Well, that might not be your strength but find out what it is, and then just do it. Play to your strengths. You can work on your weaknesses later on Sunday, but <laughs> play to your strengths. The Lord will help you work on your weaknesses. I'm not discounting working on your weaknesses. But you were put here for a reason. You've got a mission. One of my mentors, Herschel Pedersen, his nickname was Bones Pedersen. He was the center in BYU in 1955, and he was in the temple presidency in the Mount Timpanogos Temple, and he used to talk with me for hours. I'd go in. He said, Ken, what you got to do 
you've got to memorize your patriarchal blessing and take it with you in your head into the temple. Say, Heavenly Father, why am I here? What am I supposed to accomplish? And you know what? Three years ago when I was 47 years old, I was finally told. And now I'm full speed ahead. As soon as I learned what my mission was is when I got involved in this YSA mission. And I'm helping Operation Underground Railroad. And now I'm helping the missionary work in the church. And I'm helping with the Book of Mormon. And I'm helping with science and religion. I've got eight different projects I'm helping with because I found out why I'm here. So find out why you're here. And I was told this little business escapade is what got me where I am, but I'm not here for the business. I'm here to do the Lord's will. And that's what all of you, all of you were set apart before you came to this earth with a mission. But you gotta find out what it is. Don't wait till you're 47, like me, an old fat guy. I caught chest of drawers disease a few years ago. It's where your chest falls to your drawers. <laughs> it's contagious. You catch it at the dinner table. So be careful. Anyway, I just want you to know that um, how has faith influenced your journey? That is my journey. Okay. One minute. One minute. Whew. Good timing. So let me try and sum it up. <coughs> Stay fresh and learning. My first day, I came in to Infobases as their marketing director. I'm the one that came up with the idea to put all of the church books on CD-ROM years ago. And we sold it like crazy. And then Bookcraft bought it, and then Deseret Book bought it. But I showed up my first day to work, and the girl at the front desk gives me my stack of papers. She says, you need to fill them out. So I'm filling them out, and I'm, I'm, I'm the guy in charge of marketing, and marketing is how everything looks. And there's this orange extension cord plugged into the wall behind the receptionist desk, and it goes out in the hallway, and down the hallway three offices, and it goes to someone's office. I'm like, really? There's a bright orange extension cord in the front reception area. And I turned to the lady, I said, hey, what's, wrong, what's with that extension cord? She said, what extension cord? I'm like, you're kidding, it's bright orange, it's right there. She said, oh, I hadn't noticed it. It's bright orange. So I go to Paul and Dan, the owners of, of, of uh, Infobases. I say, what's with that bright orange extension cord out in the middle of the entryway? It's a little bit unsightly. I'm in charge of the image of this company. I thought we ought to try and fix it. What orange extension cord? You're kidding me. I took him out. It's right there. Oh, we hadn't noticed. So the guy who, who had the extension cord had this fridge in his office and it kept flipping the circuits. So he's really smart. So we went out to the warehouse, grabbed the white orange, bright orange extension cord, plugged it in, walked out the front, plugged it right behind the reception's desk. I'm like, can we get that? He said, no, I need my fridge. And he's more powerful than me. So six weeks later, I stopped noticing too. So what I teach all of our new employees, those with the fresh perspectives, is when you get there, grab a yellow notepad and write down all the orange extension cords that you see. Because you're the only one who sees them. And after six weeks, you won't see them either. But if you want to bring change, you've got to keep your fresh perspective. You've got to stay excited, you guys, and write them down and execute on your ideas. Or like six weeks later, you know, six months later, we moved to another office. Guess who coiled up the orange extension cord? Me. Anyway, I don't know why I told you that story, but it's a cool story, isn't it? <laughs> keep your fresh perspective, especially you freshmen, right? And go make great things happen and go out and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook, would you, out on the web? And love to keep in touch. Thanks, everybody. Did I do okay today? Thank you.